From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Ristelli at Homicide, Johnny. I was out when you called. Anything new on the Harvey Stone killing, Joe? Not a thing, but maybe we've already got all we need. Meaning Helen Barrett? We're still holding her. Joe, I don't think she did it. No? Oh, I know it all adds up to her, but... Well, just call it a hunch. Hunches are fine, Johnny, but facts are better. You want to hear some facts? I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the imperfect alibi matter, location, New York City. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 8, $1.40, cab fare to police headquarters from my hotel to talk to Lieutenant Joe Rostelli. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. Facts, you said. Facts, number one. Harvey Stone was shot in the left side of the forehead at close range with a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. The gun was near the body. Any prints on it? No, it was clean. But Helen Barrett had gloves with him. Helen says she left Harvey's apartment and went to her own to pack up. They were going to elope. When she got back to his apartment, he was dead. So she told me, Johnny. I'd like to believe her, too. She seems like a pretty nice kid, but... Uh, but what? Not enough facts in her favor. Who saw her leave Stone's apartment? We can't find anyone who did. What time did she leave? She can't remember. Did anyone see her return? What time? That's a lot of questions not to be able to answer, Johnny. Yeah, yeah, I know. What was the time of death? Medical examiner figures it's somewhere between 11.30 and midnight. Well, Helen told me she thought it was about 11 when she left Harvey's apartment and about midnight when she returned. Yeah, about. Even if she did leave, she only lives a few blocks away. There's a lot of time unaccounted for, Johnny. Yeah. Better fill me in on what you know. Well, as I get it, Harvey Stone took over the management of his father's corporation when old E.J. took to a wheelchair about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, I know. Two years ago, old E.J. married an ex-chorus girl named Daphne. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's about Harvey's age. The two of them were apparently pretty friendly, and the old man was bothered by it occasionally. Incidentally, he and Daphne are joint beneficiaries on Harvey's insurance policy. A hundred and fifty thousand worth. Sounds like you're trying to tie the old man into the killing be quite a stretch, Johnny, from his wheelchair up in Westchester County to Harvey's apartment on East 57. I know, but right now I'm more interested in Daphne. Oh? I told you last night I thought Dutch Krieger was mixed up in this. I went to his office afterward and spotted a picture of Daphne Stone on his wall. Inscription, all my love, signed Daphne. You think Daphne got Dutch to do her and himself a favor, huh? That's a possibility, isn't it? Sure, sure, it's a possibility. Trouble is, there are all kinds of possibilities. Right now, I got to stick with a probability. Helen Barrett. Uh Uh-huh. How are you doing on motive for her? Not good, not bad. We know there was some question as to whether they were going to be married or not. Helen says the hesitation was on her part. But suppose it was the other way around. Harvey decided not to go through with the marriage? Yeah. Getting cut out of the stone money would hurt some girls plenty. Maybe this was her way of getting even with him for breach of promise. (laughs) You know, Joe, for a guy who loves facts, seems to me you're edging over into hunches, too. Well, I admit it isn't a closed case by a long shot. So let's get back to facts. Harvey was shot in the forehead with a 38 Smith & Wesson sometime between 11.30 and... Excuse me. Vestelli speaking. Who? What about? Oh, well, send him in. Somebody wants to see me about the killing. Oh, you Lieutenant Rostelli? That's right. Your hand on the stone killing? Trying to. I want to talk to you about it. Sit down. Thank you. What's your name? Gentry. Alvin Gentry. So what about the stone killing? I killed Harvey Stone. What? What? Let's have that again. I said, I killed Stone. I want to make a statement. Why did you kill him? He's making a play for my girl. I didn't like it. Your girl? You mean Helen Barrett? Who? Helen Barrett, Harvey Stone's fiance. No, I don't know her. I mean my girl, Doris, a hat check girl at Barney's. Well, go on, go on. 
Well, Stone was on the make for her. Every time he came in Barney's, he'd make a play for her. I told him to lay off, and he wouldn't. He asked her to go away with him. I went to his apartment, and I killed him. How'd you kill him? I shot him. Where? I told you, in his apartment. I mean, where did the bullet hit him? Oh, in the chest. What kind of gun did you use? Forty-five cold. What'd you do with the gun? I threw it in the river. Okay, Gentry, get out. What? I said, get out. But I told you... Yeah, you told me all right. Now I'm telling you, get out. Look, I don't understand. I'll tell you what you do. You just go on out of here and think it over. When you come back with a few facts straight... Facts? Yeah, like the caliber of the gun and where Stone was shot and the location of the gun. You get the facts straight and I'll be glad to listen to you. Now get out. Okay. Confessant Sam number one. Yeah, there's always a string of them. That's one reason we don't usually release the caliber of the gun to the papers, to help weed out these confessing Sam. wonder why they do it. Uh, a psychiatrist was explaining it to me once. Something to do with repressed feelings of guilt, I think he said. Next one will probably say he stabbed Harvey Stone with a letter opener. Yeah. Well, I'm going to run out and have a talk with Daphne. Stully speaking. All right. Now, look, Mike, you take the statement, huh? Thanks. Well, I was wrong about the letter opener, Johnny. Oh? We got a guy now who claims he used a razor on Harvey. Slit his throat from ear to ear. As I left, I spent about three minutes feeling sorry for Estelle and his crank confessions, but then I dropped that routine and started feeling sorry for my own problems. The case against Helen Barrett looked pretty bad, but I still kept thinking of Daphne Stone's picture in Dutch Krieger's office. Expense account item 9320, transportation to the Stone Estate in Westchester County. I was shown into the king-size drawing room again to wait for Daphne. But then I saw a very interesting sight that wiped Daphne out of my mind for a moment. It was old E.J.'s wheelchair at the door to the solarium. And what was unusual about it was that it was empty. I edged toward the door. Then I got a glimpse of E.J. puttering around his orchids. He spotted me, though, and hobbled quickly to his wheelchair. With an abrupt wave, he wheeled into the hall and out of sight. A couple of minutes later, in came Daphne. Hello, Johnny. Daphne. Look, you said it was important that you talk to me, but I really don't feel much like talking after what's happened. I'm sure you understand. I think so. How's E.J. taking it? My husband is reacting as I suppose any father would who'd just lost his son. He's bewildered and hurt. You didn't tell me E.J. could navigate without his wheelchair. I saw him a minute ago inspecting his orchids. The wheelchair was parked near the door. I... I didn't think it was important, Johnny. It's true, he can be out of his chair for short periods, but it's rather uncomfortable for him. Out of his chair for how long? Not long enough to get into New York and back, if that's what you're wondering. Thanks. You told me it was E.J. who was opposed to Harvey's plans to marry Helen Barrett. But I found out that you were the one who was fighting it. I suppose it was foolish of me to pretend otherwise. I guess I just didn't want you to get any wrong ideas. About what? About the reason I opposed it. What's the right idea? The name of Stone means something, Johnny. Dignity, tradition, breeding. I doubt if someone like Helen Barrett, an entertainer, nice as she is, could keep that tradition alive. Are you kidding? I'm completely serious. Something like this happened once before with Harvey's secretary, Martha Winters. And you stopped it just like you were trying to stop him from marrying Helen. I don't like the way you put that. I merely persuaded him to think of the family name. <laughs> You know, you kill me, Daphne. What do you mean by that? This dose of blue blood you've picked up. Aren't you a Daphne come lady yourself? How dare you? Save it. E.J. told me he lifted you out of a chorus line when he married you. Now, how about it? Yes, it's true. So where do you get off I with this? I don't suppose you'd ever understand this, Johnny. But there are chorus girls and chorus girls. This I know. I had to support my mother somehow. But all the while, I knew that life wasn't for me. And when I got a chance at this life, I took it. And since I married Edward, I've lived the way anyone with the name of Stone should live. I've put my past behind me. 
Even Dutch Krieger? Dutch? Yeah. Yeah, I saw your picture on his office wall. He was part of the past. It doesn't exist anymore. Isn't it kind of a coincidence he tried to worm his way into one of Harvey's business deals? I had nothing to do with it. And Harvey acted correctly in refusing to have anything to do with Dutch. I see. Then you opposed Harvey's marriage to Helen to protect the family name, huh? Just as I opposed the previous attachment to his secretary. Sure it wasn't because you didn't like the idea of competition? It's a... It's a pretty low thing to say under the circumstances. Well, just what are the circumstances? It's... It's very simple. I've lost someone who was very dear to me. Even though I was Harvey's stepmother, we were practically the same age. Sure. I know people talked about it, made crude jokes about it. But I didn't care. Because I found in Harvey something I'd never had in my life before. Oh? What was that? A friend, Johnny. A real friend. I went back into the city. If I could only find somebody to establish the time period Helen had been away from Harvey's place. I went over to her apartment house, figuring there's always one tenant who knows everybody else's business. Five doorbells later, I found the one. Sure, I had to come in late, but I don't remember just what time. I was watching a program on the TV. There was this old man and woman. Yeah, with the yes, yes. Really, I, uh, what? You're sure it was Helen Barrett who came in? Well, I ought to be sure. She lives right under me. Besides, he was waiting for her and they had a talk. I couldn't quite hear what they were saying. She kept telling him to quiet down. Well, I mean, I, well, I wasn't really paying any attention. It was. No, no, of course not. You said he was waiting for her. Who do you mean? Friend of hers, at least he used to be. She used to go with him. Happen to remember his name? Sure. Gentry. Alvin Gentry. Alvin Gentry. It was Alvin Gentry who'd made the fake confession in Rostelli's office. At the time, there'd been nothing to tie him into the case. But now, according to Mrs. Carson, he was a friend of Helen's. My hunch about her innocence took a nosedive. Yeah, that confession he tried to make could be his way of trying to protect her. And that would add up to just one thing. Helen was guilty after all. Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, up pops an eyewitness and drives the final nail into the wrong coffin. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>